we are gathered here, we've got some uh, thought leaders from a couple different uh, campuses, one from uh, the UC system and one from the CSU system. Um, and we've also got some innovators and thought leaders from the uh, industry itself, so hopefully get a, a good conversation going um, today. So what I'd like to do for the panelists is if you could all just briefly uh, tell us your name and your title and briefly what you do at your organization around virtual and augmented reality or XR or whatever it happens to be. Uh, maybe start with you first, Carrie. Hi, everybody. Sorry, I can't see some of you over there. Um, my name is Carrie Shaw. I am a medical illustrator and the CEO and founder of Embodied Labs. Uh, we are a virtual reality company that makes embodied patient experiences for healthcare training um, so that you can step into the perspective of your future patient and see through their eyes. Um, so our first focus has been around aging. So looking at what, it is, what does it look like and feel like to have macular degeneration or say Alzheimer's disease and are looking to expand that model out um, to a lot of other uh, aspects of healthcare training. Hi, I'm Justin Decker. I work at DreamWorks Animation, and uh, my position is VP of Platforms and Infrastructure. So basically everything from the network through servers and all that stuff. But more relevant to this conversation is, is the build out of the, the back end systems for availability, performance, and scaling of VR experiences, animated experiences, that kind of thing. Um, I think we'll talk a little bit more later about yeah. where, what we're actually doing. Yeah, so. sounds good. Hi, my name's uh, Aaron Green. I, uh, I'm director of uh, the Worldwide Studios Creative Group at uh, Sony Computer Entertainment, AKA PlayStation. Um, so I work with all of our global game teams, um, those working on AAA titles, those working on smaller titles, uh, and those guys also working on AR and VR titles. Great. Hi everybody, my name is Dion Zell. I'm the AVP for Academic Technology at CSUN, Cal State Northridge, and also a faculty member in the business school. And I oversee the academic technology for faculty, so my job is to make sure faculty have the best and the most innovative tools at their hands to teach and learn, and that's where VR and AR comes in. So we'll talk more. Thanks, Peter. Hi, everyone. My name's Fergus Hines. I work at the minute with Pearson. Uh, amongst other things, I'm capturing film holograms like you might see seen a glimpse of earlier on with the stuff that Sean's working on with the uh, nursing faculty here, um, but also working out how the hell we get uh, all this exciting new tech uh, seamlessly into academic establishments uh, to everyone's benefit. Yeah, and my name is Jeffrey Weekly. I'm the Director of Cyber Infrastructure and Research Computing at the University of California, Merced. Um, and I am in charge of all of the stuff that is not academic technology. <laughs> so I deal with uh, researchers and we look into big data and, uh, and all of the exciting areas of research that's going on at the UC. Wonderful, thank you. All right, well I thought I'd start first uh, with Aaron because Aaron, you know, this is a educational oriented uh, uh, event. These are all educators. You come from this company called Sony, uh, PlayStation. We make so games. You make games, <laughs> right. So, but I think there's a lot to be learned, right? Because for a lot of us who've been in this space, we look at these edutainment games or these educationally oriented games, and we find them a little bit less than compelling, right? No offense to anybody who's done this development in the past. Whereas these AAA games that you mentioned in your intro before, they, they sell like hotcakes, they're very compelling. So I wanted to just get your thoughts first on, you know, what, what's, what lessons do we have to learn from these AAA games, these first-person shooter games? And then if you could walk us through a little bit about where you see Sony playing a role in the future of educational technology and the future of educational content. Sure. So, so I think, you know, one reality is uh, making games is hard, right? It, it is not an easy business. Um, and uh, it requires a lot of effort. It requires a lot of experience. You know, we have teams globally all over the world. Um, and, you know, all of them working on kind of various titles, everything from big AAA titles that you're talking about, um, to, along the spectrum to, to much more smaller kind of emotional, artistic-led titles. Um, I think when it comes to, like, the edutainment stuff, it's, kind of, it's, it's a tough thing, right? Because 
ultimately, in order to craft the kind of quality AAA experiences that we create, it requires big teams and, and a lot of gestation. I, I mean, I, I don't know, a lot of people probably don't know, like a big AAA game that we're talking about, I mean, these, these blockbuster games will have a team of 200 people working on them for anything from kind of two to five years, mm. right? Um, that's no small undertaking, right? And so if the expectation is that a small company that's trying to do an educational experience is going to be able to, to work at that, that same kind of like quality bar, it's always going to be tough. But I think the thing that is changing, though, that we are seeing is, and it's stuff that we're, we're seeing internally as well, is, is tools are getting better. You know, engines are getting easier to use. Things are getting easier to develop. Um, you know, when you start seeing all the future of, of asset creation and content creation, um, much more democratized, right? Much more easier to get in the hands of people uh, to actually do this. So, so we're working a lot on the game side. We work with a lot of indie developers, right? You know, these are people who are sometimes literally kids in their bedroom uh, working on content. And, and able to kick that out and all of a sudden get that on, you know, the PlayStation 4 in 70 million homes. Um, and so it, it's definitely, it is possible. I think from the learning side, you know, definitely I think, you know, over the years games have evolved a lot. You know, we've got to the point where we have a lot of learnings when it comes to game design of how to lead the player, how to engage players. You know, there's a lot of talk earlier about empathy. Right, that's a big focus of what we do with games. I think it's even more focused when you come to trying to engage people from an educational kind of platform. Um, but yeah, ultimately, it's, it's, it's always going to be a bit of a tough thing to try and do an apples to apples with the two, uh, two different industries. Right. C could you talk a little bit about PlayStation VR? For, for a lot of folks in the audience, they may not even know about what the PlayStation VR is. And you know, give us a sense of where, where that might be headed in, into the future. Sure. I know you can't talk specifics, but <laughs> if you could just paint us, a, paint us a, a vision of where Sony sees VR. So uh, as earlier with the HTC guys, yeah, we can't, we can't comment on any future technology that we're working on. Obviously, it's going to be awesome and the best thing ever made. But, like, <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, but ultimately, so, so PSVR, PlayStation. That's what PlayStation, I was going to say. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so, uh, so PlayStation VR, um, so that's our, our VR platform for PlayStation. Um, released relatively recently um, this year. So, yeah, I mean, essentially, it is a, a virtual reality headset that plugs into your PlayStation 4 or PlayStation 4 Pro um, and ultimately gives you access to, to virtual reality experiences in the home. Um, you know, one of the key driving factors and the reason that we've created this thing is, you know, to make it easier for people, right? You know, we, we heard earlier on today the talk of, of having high-quality VR experiences, you know, beyond what's capable with the, the phone uh, and the Google Cardboard and all that kind of stuff. And ultimately, you know, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get those high quality virtual reality experiences into the hands of more of our consumers. And so that's really the driving factor behind these. Um, the challenge with it, as with, with all the VR, that anybody who's experienced it is, you know, it's, it's, it's also kind of like measuring up those expectations where, you know, people want to have like these AAA experiences um, with VR and so you know really what we're doing now is really focusing on how we can deliver on things that are beyond just the kind of experiential demo kind of experiences that I think a lot of people have had now which is either you know location based okay I, you can stick me on the edge of uh, the Grand Canyon or you can put me underwater in a shark tank right. right now we're starting to look at okay that's great what can we now do beyond that that becomes much more of a compelling engaging experience uh, that potentially has more story to it, has more engagement to it, has more empathy and connection with characters. Um, so that's really like a big focus of, uh, of what we're looking at at the moment. Terrific, yeah. Thank you, Aaron. So I wanna turn next to uh, Justin in this sort of same theme because I would, I would think that Sony and, and DreamWorks might be seen as sort of outliers. But I know that um, Justin has done quite a lot of thinking about the experience of being in VR as being a very isolated solo experience but also some of the things that we've talked about today around how you scale it and how do you have that experience be something that could be experienced by more than just one person, an isolated experience. And I wanted to also just challenge you, Justin, to say like, what the hell is DreamWorks doing thinking about these types of problems? So could you, could you help us understand how you see things? Sure, I think, I think everybody here um, probably knows and recognizes and especially the folks on the side of the room that it's very hard to monetize VR at this point. And, um, and that's obviously a problem that we're working on because everybody in Hollywood is basically talking about VR, VR, VR. Um, 
re-engaging with audiences is a big problem for the industry. So uh, changing the experience is something that a lot of people are very interested in and in trying to figure out what is next in that regard. Worst box office sales for the summer this year since 2008. Yeah. Bad, bad year at the box office yeah, this summer. Yeah, definitely. So, so um, you know, just enhancing the exper experience is something that we're, we're that we've done a lot of experimentation on. And um, the bad news is, is that all of those experiments have ended in failure. Yeah. Um, so things like, uh, one of, well, varying degrees of failure, I guess. So one of the things that we did um, relatively recently was we set up a, a, an experience in a museum in Australia. And uh, we installed a 270 degree screen, um, seamless projection around that that space, and that was probably one of the most uh, successful experiences in trying to have multiple people within the interaction space. Um, again, there's usually, you're limited to one person being an agent and the others being sort of experiencers, if you will. Um, that's kind of a game concept, I guess, is the agency thing, but, um, so, so how do you actually then bring that forward where you do have an open environment like that with multiple people in real space but experiencing the immersion that multiple people are also interacting? So I heard some interesting, uh, some interesting thoughts about that earlier. That's why we're in it. Um, we've also tried other things like, for example, um, just saw a demo from a company called Barco that some of you probably use their products. Um, they're doing a three-screen experience in cinemas where you have the main screen that you're used to and then both the walls are actually um, full screens as well. Terrible experience. Don't try it. It's awful. And yeah, and there's, and there's questions about how do you actually author the content for that kind of a thing. Um, so, you know, is it just part of the movie where you're actually utilizing what you have available to you in terms of the experience? That kind of thing. Doesn't work. Um, what's another one? <laughs> what's another fail? Um, the dome stuff, I think, is actually the most promising. Actually, mm. so talk about that. Yeah, I was I was talking to uh, to James about this um, before the conference, and and he was saying that one of your astronomy professors has a pretty neat demo, which mm -hmm. unfortunately I didn't get to see, but um, I w it instantly sparked the thought in my head because we were trying things with domes. Um, where you actually can have multiple people in that open space doing a more ex uh, immersive experience than you get from a flat plane up here mm -hmm. as, as the secondary person watching what they're doing. But then lastly, you could have in that kind of a setting a lot of um, additional interaction as well from the other students that are in the room. So you could have, you know, someone guiding them, or you can have someone, you know, rotating the dome of the sky while they're doing something else. So um, I thought that was an interesting opportunity mm -hmm. that you guys are actually working on. So Yeah, good. All right. Appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I want to turn next to Carrie. So um, Carrie, I want to I want to explore with you the, the problem that you and Embody Labs are trying to solve. And I'd, I'd love if you could share your story about how you came into VR and, and where Embodied Labs is in terms of trying to produce empathy and why you think empathy is an important area to, to focus on and an important problem to solve. Sure, yeah. Um, so I've actually brought today my earliest prototype for um, what has turned into Embodied Labs today. And that came from my personal experience where um, about 10 years ago, uh, my mom was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's disease. And then that about five years into her disease, I was um, living at home, taking care of her and hired some of her first caregivers. And my mom happened to have this left visual field deficit along with her, um, her dementia. And um, so I would start to explain to her caregivers, you know, she has a left visual field deficit and that means she can't see out of the left hand of both of her eyes and you know like you guys just did everyone kind of glazes over like all right I don't know what you're talking about turn off my brain and this was really important for her safety and I realized you know instead of just talking about it why don't I why don't I do this so I said here put on these goggles this is what she's seeing and they immediately knew okay 
I need to protect her body on this side. Um, if she's going to see things, they have to come from her right side. And, oh, that's why she eats exactly half of her plate of food at mealtime, and I have to rotate it so that she finishes all her food. Um, and so that sparked this idea for me of, you know, what if we could do more than just show this one visual um, condition? What if we could simulate the patient's world and that human experience and, and complex experience? Um, and so my background is in public health and then medical illustration um, and, and embodied labs. When, when I discovered VR, I said, this is the medium that can actually accurately portray the, the patient experience. Um, and so to Today we are, you know, working on aging and portraying the experience of aging um, to, to say, does this make us more effective care providers? Um, and so speaking back to this concept of empathy, um, one of the things that I've, I've confronted in our first 15 months of a, as, as a company while trying to work with academic institutions in health sciences and also um, groups like hospital systems or long-term care and staff training is, you know, we all love to talk about empathy. It sounds great, it brings us warm, fuzzy feelings in our stomach, but when it comes down to it, what's the return on investment? How does empathy affect our bottom line? And I think what should happen in the VR space, I'm gonna go ahead and just make a big statement here, is say, let's stop calling it the empathy machine and let's call it a behavior change tool. Mm. Because we want, we empathy is, is a nice, thing to happen, but what we really are doing is we're using this so that we can see our CNAs understand care practices, which means our patients will be safer. Um, our patients will give better satisfaction scores. Um, you know, here a concrete example of our pilot we did with med students with our, our vision and hearing lab was that med students said, I never realized that I can be fully cognitively functioning and if I can't see in here, it may appear that I have a cognitive impairment. So that, that deals with accurate diagnosis. Mm. Um, so that's, that's the shift that I would really like to begin seeing in how we talk about um, VR as a behavior change tool. Yeah, wonderful. I, I'm just I'm thinking about our, our current administration and how, how beneficial it would be for everyone to be able to try and step into the shoes of another person um, do you tell us a little bit about your thoughts about, you know, where, where we are to try and create embodied experiences for other types of disciplines, other types of users? Yeah, um, definitely. There's great research. So the, the theory of embodied cognition says that if we can actually trick our minds into feeling present and immersed in a virtual world, then that is registering in our brain as something that we've experienced. It, it adds to our life experience. Um, and so in terms of, of embodying people of different cultures or skin colors, there's great data to suggest that this really can uh, change our, our implicit biases um, so that we show you know, less um, stereotyping and, and better practices uh, for diversity. Um, one of the things that we looked at in, at Embodied Labs was how does this affect people's attitudes towards aging? So we saw um, in, in our pilot with med students that they described uh, elder, they were more ageist before they went through this experience than after. Um, and so I, I think that VR can also show a lot of rich complexity. Um, and in our first experience that, that dealt with um, hearing and vision impairment, you embody someone who's African American. And we really didn't make that an explicit goal of, of the simulation, but I saw it as a great opportunity to say, we know the majority of medical students are uh, white, and we know that data shows that embodying other races can have a positive effect. Um, and I think that, that in my observations over the last 15 months, months, um, I've seen that this, these experiences make it safe for the disability community or for minority communities to speak out, and it gives them a visual vocabulary to really share their own experiences, even if they're different from the one they went into VR for, they can connect with a piece of that and then speak out. So um, I see this as being a really great culture shift tool as well. Yeah, fantastic. And just want to plug the work of Jeremy Balenson. I don't know if he's a name that folks know, but I know Carrie and I have spoken about Jeremy Balenson's work. This whole notion of embodied cognition is something that he came up with from his work at the at the Stanford Virtual Human Interaction Lab. So I, I would strongly encourage everybody to, to note that name down, Balenson, and, and do a little work. And again, it provides a lot of the uh, the data 
around the empirical studies that have been done to prove some of these ideas that Carrie has been talking about. So uh, thank you for that, Carrie. Um, so I want to turn next to, to Dion. So, you know, from a more practical perspective, you know, it seems like there's this tremendous potential for uh, students to be engaged in creating this content using this tremendous technology that we've been talking about. And I know at, at, at CSU Northridge, you had this thing called the VAR Jam. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the VAR Jam, what, would that, what that was about, and what did you learn about the VAR Jam from that experience? Sure. Well, we learned a lot. Um, and uh, this was our third attempt. Every year we do something called an X, so it's an exploration into emerging technologies. And we had done apps for two years, and last year we did VAR. So we smushed the two together and just said, take out an A and just call it virtual. You know, it sounds better than VR slash AR. Um, so it was a competition, and we followed this recipe now for about four or five years. And we start the semester, one semester, with the faculty side. So we dive deep into the technology and look at its application across the board. In terms of disciplines, we invite faculty to brown bags, and you know they get their feet wet. We brought in the whole vibes and all that. Um, and then the second year or semester, we run a competition. And the origin of the competitions is we couldn't find the talent. I mean, back in the days when apps were hard to create, we had a very futuristic provost, and we wanted to dive in and try to help. Uh, faculty create apps because they were actually asking for apps because they had learned how to create e-texts and now they wanted apps so their students could study while they were in line waiting. And okay, I called up a number of app companies and they were all, you know, thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars for a basic app. So we said, wait a minute, we have forty thousand students. There's mm -hmm. got to be talent out there. Mm -hmm. So we launched a campus-wide um, competition, intentionally made it cross-discipline, um, and I'll switch to virtual reality now. And they have a month, so it's not a hackathon. We thought about the weekend hackathon model, but there were too many legal reasons about having students on campus all weekend. And so they, the students have a month. We, we give them the challenge. In this case, it was create something with virtual or augmented reality that can help human lives, you know, made it really open. And uh, we began, I'm so glad you mentioned Jeremy Balenson, yeah. because we piped him in, <laughs> and uh, he couldn't come down, fly down and visit in person, but, uh, we brought him in virtually, and he presented his research and getting at the behavioral change. I mean, the, the examples he shows, I'm sure they're cutting down a tree and diving with the dolphins. And he said that after you experience those things, your behavioral change is more profound and more lasting than anything else. So I couldn't endorse him more. Um, and so the, the students got wind of that too. And to make a long story short, we held the competition and uh, the judges were composed of faculty, staff, students, and also industries. So we brought in Dell, we brought in Google, and they served as the judges. And the students had to actually make something. So as you're probably wondering, it's like, you know, how do you make something in VR, AR, like in a month? We did let them do a prototype. So if they could create, or convince us that what they wanted to build was potential, or had potential, and they could make it seem lifelike, they could, um, they could win, and they had to create a video, like an info commercial, you know, a commercial showing us why would you want to fund this? Mm. And the results were amazing. I mean, year after year, the students have just blown us away. So it was open to VR and AR, and the winning VR uh, uh, project was by an accountant, an accountant major, and she went to Yosemite, she stuck a 360 camera in her backpack mm. and trailed all over Yosemite and called it Adventure VR and stitched it together. I mean, it was just amazing. Mm. So she was our top winner. And then in augmented reality, it was from a nutrition, a team of nutrition students who were trying to help people with diabetes and they created an, uh, an AR app that you would walk into a supermarket and scan the food and it would tell you the nutritional content for the food that in particular would help diabetic patients. Um, and that's just the start, you know. Mm -hmm. So they're all available on our um, website. So if you just Google CSUN VAR, you'll, you'll find them. And so uh, then the next question was, okay, how do we help the students take their ideas to the next level? Because in some cases they wanted to. And so we partnered with um, two incubator firms. One's called Lacey, which is the Los Angeles Clean Tech Incubator. And the other was the Bixel Exchange, which is the innovation arm of the LA Chamber of Commerce. And they 
offered prizes, which were a chance to become a portfolio firm. So these are firms which take an idea, you have to compete to get in, and then you're given all these resources, networks, access to labs, equipment, you name it. You know, and then they can uh, help actually commercialize and monetize mm. their creations. Mm. So I think we're really happy with the strategy. And then, just to finish up, the, the goal was twofold. If we can get the talent, then we hire those students and we, use, we pair them up with our instructional designers and we find faculty who want this content and bingo, you have all the ingredients you need to actually create instructional virtual and augmented reality. So that's what we've been doing and we're gonna do artificial intelligence next year, so I'm not sure how that one will work out. But anyway, I couldn't um, underscore the, the JAM model more. It's, just, it's a lot of fun and students love it and uh, they go great places with it. So Dion, from a practical perspective though, if I'm a student who's interested in this but I know zippity doo -dah about how to do this, how did you guys anticipate that and facilitate the learning of the students to be able to do these great projects? Yeah, great question. So we were low budget, so we basically used the you know, point and learn model. So we created a course in Canvas, or our LMS, and uh, uh, myself and a number of team members who were interested just scoured the web for resources, tools. You know, in this case, it was Unity. We found out Unity is free. You, know, mm -hmm. you can download it. And you know, it sort of blew us away. So uh, we, we showed them where the resources were. And there's a number of apps out there that are on uh, you know, iOS or, or Android platforms. Uh, I'm blanking on the names right now. But you can basically create augmented reality. And it was all for free. Yep. Um, and you know, they didn't have the, the big computers yet, but they didn't need to, because you can create stuff in Unity and render it and then show how it would work. So and that was it. So we had a, a certain a number of milestones. We had one Friday kickoff where we found experts throughout campus. We have one faculty member who's just teaching VR now. He came and gave an hour long on VR. We had someone come in and do 360 video, uh, 360 photo, just enough to say, okay, on your market set, go. Hmm. You know, and then we sat back and watched what would happen. And that's all that we had to do. Wow, okay, tremendous. And how successful have the commercialization efforts been as, for, as the projects that you mentioned are concerned? Well, they take time, as you can imagine. We ran into copyright, you know, the $64,000 question. Who owns the content? You know, especially when it was a faculty member's idea, but they created it on CSUN time. Yeah. And uh, we found that each one is a case-by-case -case basis, so we actually have an intellectual property expert now who is helping each team go through. Um, so to answer your question, it's slow but steady. Uh, we've had a, a couple. We had one, uh, it's called Matador Patrol app, which the LA sorry, uh, the CSUN Police Department picked up. It's a way to um, use apps to pair people up and walk across campus safely. So it's a little slower than we'd hoped because you know it takes a huge amount of resources and motivation. And these are students. They're trying to finish their degree. You know, so just trying to find time to work on their app, believe it or not, was a hard part. So we're trying to help them as much as we can. Right. Well, I'm very excited about that model because I do think that there's an opportunity to, to sort of solve that log jam that dearth of content problem by leveraging students' interest in creating these apps because they want to develop the skills necessary and show something in their portfolio. So if they could create something that's of sufficiently high quality and then get some backing from some commercial entity who could then pour more dollars into it and develop that, that's fantastic, right? That's really, really exciting. Yeah, terrific. Um, I want to turn next uh, to Jeff. So, so Jeff, um, you and I were chatting just briefly before the session and, and we were exchanging some, e some emails. So I had no idea that you've been in the virtual reality space for as long as you've been. So I'd first love to just get, pick your brain a little bit and share with the audience about you know, high, high level things that have changed in the industry over the last several years that you've been in the space. And then I'd love to give you uh, an opportunity to talk a little bit about your WAVE project at UC Merced and what that project is about and why it's different from the sort of things that the folks at San Diego State are doing with their vital space. So first of all, um, before I came to the University of California in Merced, I was a faculty member at the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California, which you may never have heard of, um, but it is a uh, research university that is geared towards masters and PhDs for mostly military students um, focusing on problems of the military. Now, if you think about the three big pillars of innovation in uh, America, and maybe even arguably around the world, you have entertainment, you have education, and you have government and military. 
Um, and it just so happens at the Moves Institute, which is modeling virtual environments and simulations, we were all three of those things. So we built the first uh, network persistent virtual environment called NPSNet. And a virtual environment is maybe VR, maybe not, um, but it is like Second Life. Um, you can go in and you can you know, look around and do things, and when you leave, it's still there. So presumably, you know, the pot of gold that you left when you left the virtual environment will be there when you get back. And that was something that had never been done before. We did that in the 90s. Um, and there were a lot of problems to solve with that. Um, basically, the first problem was there was no such thing as a graphics card. So yeah. that made doing graphics kind of hard. Um, so we had to use CPUs, and CPUs weren't that great. And if we got 10 frames a second, good enough. So that sort and and I remember making models that had polygon counts in the thousands and thinking, this is going to crash the whole system. <laughs> so technology um, was very different back then. Um, and we were constrained by what was available. But that, in some ways, made us deliver really kind of creative solutions. Um, and so a lot of the protocols that are used in virtual environments today um, in video games were developed um, through a standards process aided by the work we were doing at the Naval Postgraduate School. And it's all under the hood and you don't realize it happened, but it was done and it was hard work and it was a lot of fun. Um, so the, the biggest change that I have observed is that um, uh, the, the hardware has just enabled you know all kinds of and the software, all kinds of really great content. The thing that hasn't changed, and this may shock some of you, but VR is the next big thing. <laughs> it's been the next big thing for 25 years. Yeah. Um, but I was commenting this morning that maybe we're at a tipping point, right? And I, so, about 10 years ago, I was like, I'm sick of this. I don't want to do this anymore. VR is never going to be a thing. I'm going to do something else. What's a thing that I could do that is still a really hard problem um, and that's interesting, that uses a network? So I switched to network streaming video. And we put a challenge that we wanted to be able to do high definition streaming video over the network. We wrote protocols to take a video frame and turn it into an IP packet. Um, and we did things like broadcast courses or multicast courses over this thing called the M-bone, the multicast backbone. Um, and so video um, was something that was still really hard and it pushed all my buttons about you know, networking and infrastructure and, and, and in some ways art. And, and, uh, um, and we worked all the way up to uh, 4K. So 4K was sort of the last big problem that I worked on. Um, and we did the world's first stereo streaming of 4K from the Monterey Bay Aquarium to San Diego and then on to Tokyo. That technology was used in the 2012 Olympics and the 2014 World Cup and even the 2016 Olympics in Rio. Um, and a few years ago, I found myself thinking, huh, Maybe VR is the next big thing. <laughs> it's the so next, next big I, thing. So I personally emerged off of the, out of the trough of disillusionment, yep. and I came back to virtual reality. Now, in that, in, in that time, I had retired from the Naval Postgraduate School, because when you're in the military, you can do 20 years and then retire. Um, and I was living in New Zealand, and I was working at the National Research Network of New Zealand, and I was the education manager um, the science and education manager for this national network. And I got an email from a guy named Tom DeFonte. And some of you may know that name, and some of you may be lucky enough to know who that is. But Tom literally invented the VR cave. Mm -hmm. His master's degree summer project was the visual effects sequence of the trench run in Star Wars. So this guy knows his stuff. Right. And I do whatever Tom tells me to do. And I just got an email that said, 
you need to apply for this job. <laughs> so I looked at it and I'm like, huh, he's right again. So it just so happened that I was coming back to the States and I did my interview and got the job. And one of the reasons I said yes was because of the WAVE. And the WAVE is an acronym. It's not a great acronym. It stands for Wide Area Visualization Environment. Um, but uh, it's this sort of DIY thing that we built with uh, I only, we only spent, and this is shocking, I know, I know where I'm at, I'm not in the military anymore, I'm, I'm in a public university, we only spent $225,000. But we got a 166 megapixel walk-in VR environment, the world's largest walk-in VR environment. So when you put a pair of goggles on, you might get two megapixels at maybe a 100 degree field of view, we're 166 megapixels at over 200 degree field of view. Hmm. You can literally step into this thing. It's like a recumbent wave. Um, but you know, it's really only built on technology that you can buy at Best Buy. I bought most of it from B&H. Hmm. Um, mm -hmm. And we strung it to, I got a great price on these 3D TVs too. <laughs> no um, tax. Yeah, no tax. We, we strung it together with a 10 gig network. I've got 10 computers doing the rendering engines. We bought nice gamer cards, GTX 1080s. I think uh, when I put that in the requirements for the bid, the guy that probably was looking at this thing, and we're never going to get these graphics cards, you know, because they were just coming out. But we got them, and we put it together. The only thing custom in the whole room is the aluminum frame that holds it all together, and it's 80-20. And, and so what do we use it for? So the wave, think, of, okay, so we all took biology, and we might have looked, peered through a microscope to see a slide, and we were looking through a lens, right? Well, the wave is just a different kind of lens. And we don't use it for education per se. Um, it's not really ADA compliant, and I can't fit more than maybe eight or 10 people in this space. Um, it's used for research. We built another one in the library that we can use for a classroom. It's just three panels, and it's much more accessible. But the wave is meant to be a lens into the complexity of the kind of data and the research that people are doing. So we use it to look at bioinformatics, um, visualizations of health records and public health. Um, we take it and use it for cyber archaeology, which is really interesting. You know, archaeology is by its nature a destructive process. You dig something up and you kind of destroy it. Well, we can send in LIDAR and drones and 360 cameras, and we can document the stuff, and we can build time series, and we can look at these things um, at one-to-one -one scale in this gigantic environment. And so it, I call it the magic carpet time machine because that's what it does. It can transport you um, to any place, well, that we have the data. So with the extra money that we had, because I had a $450,000 budget, and I built the thing for 225, we bought ecosystem stuff. Computers, software, cameras, drones. Um, and so these things do not exist in, in a vacuum. You have to have content creation. And so now we have a wave, which is the visualization part, and we have a lab where we teach students how to make VR content. Oh, so that's the wave. Wow, fantastic. Yeah, appreciate that story. Fantastic. Um, I'd, I'd like to turn next to, to Fergus. So um, Fergus, you know, Pearson's been doing some amazing stuff in terms of immersive learning uh, through, through last year and through, through this year. Um, some fantastic projects in the UK and Australia and New Zealand, uh, here in the States, here at San Diego State and Texas Tech. Um, would love for you to just walk us through the sorts of things that that you're hoping to find in terms of these projects. What are what are you what do you think you're going to be finding? And 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 share with us where where that's sort of taking you now in terms of your journey about immersive learning. Sure, thanks, Peter. Um, I guess today helped uh, reaffirm something I'd been thinking about for a while. It's about how, from a content creator's point of view to an educator's point of view or learner's point of view, um, success of this technology is all about obligation. So it's what obligations do each of us in that role hold? And it's um, sort of affirmed it for me today even more is 
the obligation right now is heaviest on the content creator's role. If we don't make great content, the experiences aren't going to draw or inspire teachers to try and use them. And if teachers don't try and use them, students aren't going to get anything out and they're not going to be able to close that loop to make even better content with that feedback. In terms of building new stuff, um, the relationship with partners like San Diego State University, Texas Tech, as you mentioned, University of Canberra, Mind Lab, and the high schools in New Zealand. We're just trying stuff every day, trying new things. We've got a whole research program to learn what works and what doesn't, because ultimately it's the teachers of any shape or form that are going to tell us what works for them. It's not going to be um, us wrangling people into one-size-fits-all scenarios. We've got to work out and be flexible and malleable to get stuff that teachers want to teach with. It's only going to form part of the teaching toolkit. It's not like we think it's this panacea that's going to change teaching forever. It's going to help certain scenarios. Mm. If you follow the principles of good education design, you're going to get to get good results with this new technology. If you railroad this new technology uh, to get it in because it's new and shiny, you'll most likely fail. Um, when I first started working in an office, um, there were basically sort of three generations of people working in that office. There were those real old school guys in the C-suite who did everything via post. There were people who were probably 15 years younger than them, but still, in my eyes, back then, pretty old, probably my age now, who did everything via fax. And then there was us whippersnappers that did this crazy thing called email, mm -hmm. which we couldn't for love nor money get our superiors to use or engage with. Mm -hmm. And then lo and behold, six, seven months after my first day in that job, when I just couldn't believe these dinosaurs weren't using email, mm -hmm. everyone's using email. Sure, there's still a few bits of posts going around, like contracts and really important physical documents and stuff like that, but facsimiles had been killed. And no one mourned their death. No one thought about them for a second moment. And we didn't have any summits about this newfangled, dangerous email technology <laughs> with these old dudes. We just forced it down their throats until they realized <laughs> it gave them time back. And I, and I see learning in its simplest form as basically parcels of communication passed back and forth between teacher and learner. And if we think about post, facsimile, and email as parcels of communication, let's try and use the new emergent immersive realities uh, and technologies, and let's play with them and work out what works and see what, what of our existing learning toolkit becomes the facsimile. What's going to die? What mm. does it replace? Mm. Um, I think of all the stuff that we've done, the thing that was most uh, revealing in mm. terms of the research we're doing was we took a very, very early stage, nascent form of our hollow chemistry app. That's a high school app. For, to allow teachers and students to look at the... Well, I was rubbish at chemistry as a kid. It's the complex spatial gaps of molecules. And this is for high school kids, so it's nothing like the amazing nanopro stuff of that atomic correctitude. This is diagrammatic stuff. And we'd worked loads and worried and finessed about how this could be best demonstrated, how we could create learning and, and, and teaching assets around this, and we'd very hastily put together a little sort of sideshow, which was a builder, which allowed teachers to, and students to build their own models. And we put this in front of a bunch of 14-year-old kids in a high school in Australia, and with no lesson plan, no teacher, uh, and just let them play with this stuff to look at the demonstrations. And we came back to the room, and 15 minutes later, they weren't looking at any of the demo stuff. They'd found the builder, and they were building the molecules of all mm. the illicit stuff that they're not allowed in their labs. Mm -hmm. Or indeed, El Chapo's not allowed in his labs. Do you yeah. mean, this was, they were doing everything naughty they could. And they were engaged, and they were pumped, and they were amped. And I think we must never, ever forget as content creators, it doesn't matter about the technology. If what we're doing doesn't give students the autonomy, the agency to engage in their own learning, we're failing. So that's what we're focused on. That's what all our project, projects are focused on currently. Oh, fabulous. Yeah, fantastic. Appreciate that. All right, I want to open it up a little bit now to, to anybody who wants to answer this. And I want to start with the elephant in the room. And it was referenced earlier today in, in Vinay's presentation, but I want, to, I want to get your perspective on it as well. So there's a lot of folks uh, out there who are doing a lot of hand wringing and a lot of teeth clenching saying VR is dead. Um, so I, I would love to give you all an opportunity to respond to that. Um, I would imagine you're on the stage because you don't think VR is dead, right? But how do you respond to that? And, and, and is it something about just 
we had the wrong expectations? Is it something along what, what Jeff was saying about the technology is really not there yet? Would, would, love, your, would love your thoughts on that. Uh, can I just go qu really quickly? Of course. I've got a big bugbear about this. I think the most damaging thing about, and it comes down to what my background is, which is branding and marketing, the word R, the R word, reality, has caused the biggest issues in this space. Because if you tell someone, I'm going to show you a virtual reality, subliminally or not, that word reality is so loaded, I expect to be able to interact how I do in real life, mm. right? So the, the, the emergence of, of immersive technology as a, sort of a catch-all term is so much safer because we're not saying you, we're going we're gonna to solve all these interactions and interventions you can do in the real world. We're doing something immersive that's not the real world. It's a different technology. This word reality kills us every time because until we have great haptics, until we have actual touch, feel, smell, feedback, we're always going to be disappointed with that reality. Mm. Yeah. And, and I think to, to Jeff's point earlier as well, it's like, you know, it's, it's, it's been the next big thing for the last, like, 20 years, it's also been dying for the last 20 mm -hmm. years, right? It's a cockroach. That's, 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 that's the whole thing. Is, and I think, you know, the, the, the reality is as well is that, that, you know, people are impatient, right? Everybody wants, like, it to be absolutely perfect and amazing now. And the reality is with, with any technology, right, it's going to take a bit of time. Um, I think what you are seeing now is that pivotal point, though, where, you know, previously, I think the technology has always been evolving and always been moving. But now just the level of engagement and the level of backing and funding and people and companies and just general collective kind of zeitgeist of people getting, getting kind of like behind this technology is huge, right? This is way beyond anything else that's come before, I think. So, you know, I think just simply from that fact, it's not going to go away anytime soon. You know, it's definitely going to be something that people continue to invest in. <laughs> The technology is constantly, like Vinay was saying this morning, is going to get smaller, better, you know, the barriers to entry, uh, which is a lot of the problems right now that people complain about, all of that's going to start to disappear soon. You know, companies like our friends in the corner there, the fruit guys, they're, they're you know, <laughs> I'm sure at some point going to, uh, going to come up and show everybody how cool it, uh, it can be. How it's supposed to be done. Yeah, how it's supposed to be. That's how they describe it, yeah. Um, but, uh, but ultimately, you know, that's, that's, that's really kind of like where we're at with it. I think, you know, it's, we're, we're all, it's, you know, it's always tough when you're on the cusp of something until really it's been delivered and it's that full mass market thing where all of a sudden everybody's like, you know, all of a sudden my mother now is now telling me about VR, this VR experience somebody showed her on her phone the other day, right? That's when you know it's finally getting, getting hold, right? When my mum tells me it's happening, it's, we're, we're all good. Yeah, yeah right, right. I, I would say my take on that, uh, incorporate some of the elements of everything that's been said, which is that we might be at a tipping point if we can just get enough content that's, that's good quality content. I think that's the key to unlock that and, and move on to ubiquity, right? Um, but it's a catch-22. We were kind of talking about this earlier. They're not going to manufacture um, hardware that's cheap enough to get it to be ubiquitous and in the hands of consumers unless there's enough content. People aren't going to generate content unless there's a way to monetize right. that. And so, um, you know, that's, I think that's the trick to true success for, I, I for think, VRA. I think to that point, though, I think, you know, where, where you're going to see the broadest success mm -hmm. is with the phones, right? This is, you know, it's technology people already have. So that becomes the very easy gateway. Yeah, um, and that's why for, AR for is kind of the thing right exactly. now. Exactly. Yeah. So I think, you know, that's where... You know, one of the biggest challenges with this, right, is it's a very experiential thing. You know, it's one of the things we were talking about earlier is it's very difficult, and for you guys, like from an educational platform, right, you've got that challenge of somebody's inside the VR, what's everybody else doing, right? And, and, and also for people who haven't experienced it before, it's a very difficult thing to articulate, and it's a very difficult thing to, uh, to describe. And from a PR and, and, and a marketing perspective, I think everybody's done a terrible job of it, right, because it is such a hard thing to articulate. So I think, you know, just as more and more people experience it, as more and more people see the potential in it and see what it can be, I think that's when you start to go really going to see the, the movement and the snowballing effect of, of this, all of this stuff being taken up. And then I also think from the content perspective, you know, it's also a technological thing in terms of the tools as well for the content creation, right? You know, people are only just really, you know, Adobe's only just coming out with good kind of tools for, for 360 video. Right, you know, all of this stuff is kind of like coming along, and so 
now you know you're going to start seeing much much more content right that's, that's a good point authoring hasn't really been consumerized at yeah. this point yeah. yeah and that was the tipping point for video yeah um so when you were able to uh, uh shoot video and edit on your pc and publish it um on youtube that's when it happened mm -hmm. um and i just want to say about the technology involved in in virtual reality augmented reality virtual environments there is nothing technologically left to solve. The things that are still left to solve are human computer interaction, storytelling, and game. That's what's left. So think of it like uh, at the time of the Nickelodeon when you'd pay five cents to watch one of the Lumiere Brothers movies or the train pulling into the station. That's where we are with, with VR right now. We know how to we know how to, uh, you know, the technology's there. It's just the human creative expression and the ability to um, turn that into compelling experiences that we're lacking. So I'm going to expose my ignorance by challenging you on that. I think there are some technological issues that still need to be worked out. Um, you know, delivery at the right frame rates and um, in a mobile fashion, right? So we've seen some good tests for that's 60 just a matter of scale, second. though. It is. It is scale. That's all. You're it's right. just scale. Yeah, I, and I don't and I don't disagree with what you said. Actually, I think those are the big problems. But there's still how do you create these very large immersive environments um, by federating content from multiple um, you know content generators? And you know, so somebody earlier said we need standards. We need those kinds of frameworks, but we need the, app, uh, the platform and the application development frameworks as well to achieve that. And then also, you know, the speed in the networks as well. Dion? Um, I would add also that one barrier has been it's perceived as isolating you, but I don't think that's the case anymore because, again, I don't know the names, but I know there's apps where, you know, it's like Second Life round two, except you don't have an avatar. You are the avatar, and you're in there. You know, anyone who has kids under 16 knows that they spend inordinate hours on their virtual, not virtual yet, on their video games. Um, Minecraft, thank you. Yeah, and you know, you go check on them in their rooms and you think, oh, they're isolated. No, they're online with their entire neighborhood, you know, being more social than they've ever been before. So if that happens to VR, it's... Different, different form of interaction. Exactly. Has anybody seen Sword Art Online by any chance? Watch it, it's a great anime that deals with this issue in particular. Sword, sword Art Online. Sword art. Uh, I think it's on Netflix. Kerry yeah. Yeah. Fergus, did you guys want to weigh in on this question of VR is dead? It's definitely not. <laughs> I would say um, VR, the why VR question is, is starting to show up with some successful use cases and um, I actually would maybe even disagree with you about the phone technology being a good thing for VR. I think it's helped us get, get the vocabulary of like, oh yeah, we can be on a roller coaster because I tried it on my phone in my Google Cardboard. Um, but it's also made, I've had so many people say, oh yeah, I tried VR, it was awful. Almost like food poisoning. If you get uh, nauseous in VR, yeah. like you don't really want to go near it again. Good point. Um, that's, a that's the three that's screen experience. Yeah. But then, how yeah, do we I get agree. how do we get past that and show? You know, it makes it even more important that we we do have the right hardware out there and people are getting that access first. Um, I think also the the pricing, the business models for VR companies, um, because we're saying, oh, VR is available on our phones. People say, okay, well, why isn't it 99 cents or yep. free? Yep. And when you look at the, the production costs, that's why it's not 99 cents or free. It's not a parallel, even though it kind of feels like it might be. Um, so I, I do think we're starting, I mean, even just from my own uh, being at month 15 in a startup, I mean, one, I'm at month 15, could have, I had lot every couple months and like, are we gonna still be here in a couple months? I don't know. And you know, we, we make those steps and sell our experiences and get that feedback that this is in fact something that people see value in both 
for you know their their training program or um, you know they're going to come on with some some money there to say this is worth paying for and I think that's that shows that yeah we're it's slow progress like everything but um, because we now have consumer products that are iterating um, we're going to be able to make this a real a real um, ecosystem. So I just want to say something real quick about um, the product life cycles and innovation. Um, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, when I was doing VR, it was definitely the domain of military and aerospace. And um, it really wasn't you know, something that anyone could pick up. I mean, an SGI IRIX machine was started at like $250,000. So, um, uh, but on, on that innovation cycle, it's not gonna happen. I mean, the Navy procures a submarine and it takes 20 years to build it. Um, it just, it doesn't match. But once it jumped from that domain to entertainment, where there is a constant innovation, and the, and the graph looks like this. Um, it's not even a step function. It's like this. Um, it really had a shot. Um, and I think that, that hitching to that wagon uh, is what will make the difference. Yeah. It also seems to me like one of the most important barriers to access are tools. So I will confess, I have downloaded Unity. I have spent a couple hours in Unity, and I am nowhere in Unity. Um, and so, you know, Dion, you find the, an undergraduate. Yeah, okay. But I was going to say to to Dion to Dion's point, though, obviously there's enough, but is there enough to scale? There are those folks that can go out there and teach themselves how to do Unity. So I, I encourage you guys to take a look at what Metaverse is doing with their tool, very, very simple. If you, I'm somewhat dating myself, but if you remember HyperCard and HyperStudio from back in the day, well, this is like the 2017 version of uh, HyperCard and HyperStudio, right? But with, with, um, with uh, API calls, right? It's, it's like the, 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 the new version of that. So I wanted to get your thoughts on that too. Do you, do you agree with that? That if, if we just had better, better tools to do, really to democratize the content creation, we would see an acceleration in the industry as a whole. I suppose it's probably a pretty obvious point, but does anybody want to challenge that? I would say, I mean, it's, it's one of those challenging things. I mean, like even with the video thing that came, I mean, what it does do as well at the same time is open the floodgates to terrible content. Yep, 99.999% I mean, so, 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 I mean, crap. Yeah, right. I yeah. mean, it's, it's so, so absolutely it puts the power in the hands of, of, of creators who would otherwise not have the ability, you know, where like video used to be the domain of the video production facilities and the studios and, and unless you were, were, were kind of somewhere in that system, you had no hope of doing something. Um, and that all changed, but at the same time, yeah, loads of people started putting out terrible, terrible videos. Yeah, good point. Um, and, and same thing with the App Store, right? I mean, the App Store was, was uh, when it first started, a lot of very, very good quality content on there. Um, now on there, huge swath of content. I mean, I can't remember what it is. It, it, like it's hundreds of thousands of apps kind of like every day or something going out on there, and like not all of them are great. Um, so yeah, Nice work, Apple. Yeah, nice work, Apple, well done. Um, <laughs> But I think, you know, that, that's, that's always going to be the thing. And, and I think, you know, I, I feel like an overriding kind of, uh, an overarching thing that we're talking about is, you know, it's compelling content. The, the, the requirement for compelling content will never go away. Yeah. In the same way, you know, the requirement for good quality storytelling, for good engagement with people, for, you know, for being able to kind of like put that effort in will never replace, the technology will never replace that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? You know, no matter how good, the, the pixel counts are and the resolution and the frame rates and all of that kind of stuff. If the content sucks, it sucks. Right. Right. So, I mean, that's where all of the effort and, and the focus truly needs to be yeah. is, is, is on the content. Carrie? Yeah. yeah, I think um, the content, so as a startup that makes content that then pitches to Im investors and says, here's what we're building, we're building this library of experiences. Um, I've heard back, well, you know, it's just content, we don't invest in content. Um, 
And I think in this case, content is the horse, and what comes with good content are in the cart are these tools that we can then, um, be, you know, we've created them in the process of developing something that's useful that we're actually implementing. Um, so, so yeah, I think good content will produce tools that can then be fed back into the ecosystem. Um, we saw, so I was just part of the EdSim challenge that the Department of Education put on, and um, a company, Oso VR, uh, they, they won the challenge, and one of the things they said is we're gonna take what we developed for surgical training and give it back to the community so that they can develop trainings for whatever they want. Um, and that's something that we've thought about too as we're building embodied experiences, we're creating filters and algorithms to simulate conditions and, and then maybe you can take that back and share any human experience with these tools that we've already created and saw value for. Um, we also as a company have been developing a framework that says what happens beyond just the VR piece? What has to happen before VR, after VR to integrate it into a curriculum? Um, and, and so we wanna be as open as we can about sharing that framework so that people can replicate it with their own content. Um, so yeah, I guess that's my, my big plug is that content will define find um, these resources that can then scale the ecosystem. Well, and you brought up the, the uh, notion of uh, openness as well as you were speaking just now, and, and I strongly agree with that too. I think that's probably another element in, in you know, pushing it over the hump here. Um, and, and you were talking about in your, in your jams. Um, yeah, what do we call them? <laughs> anyway, um, we call them hackathons, but in your jams, uh, they're there was this question that uh, was raised about IP ownership. Um, you know, that's, that's gonna be the killer of openness to some degree, but what's interesting is that in, in my industry, we've drawn a pretty clear line about that. So um, if you build the tool set, you own the IP to the tool set, but if you're using the tool set to generate content, you own the content. Um, and, and I think that that demarcation is helpful in regards to um, institutions like this that aren't actually trying to create the product for revenue generation, um, you know, they have the option to actually make that open and release that to the public, less, much less so than, say, a, an underfunded startup, you know. <laughs> all right, one last question for the panel, then we'll open it for questions from the audience. So I'd, I'd ask you all to, to reflect a little bit, and if you could think, what is the killer VR, AR app for education? And I'll open up to anybody who wants to jump in on that. Crickets. <laughs> well, I'll give it a shot. Um, I don't know if it's one technology alone, but you know, I, I keep imagining textbooks coming to life. You know, suddenly there are a combination of VR and AR and AI. Um, you know, this little thing on your walking around on your shoulder, and it knows it knows everything. It knows what you know. It knows what you don't know. It knows how you feel. Um, because when you start to apply you know, machine learning and those sorts of things to data, and everything's about facial recognition, I mean, things will know. How, there's this whole field called affective computing where the machine will know. So suddenly you've got this personalized AR, VR widget, whatever you want to call it, that's talking to you and showing you things and reading your emotions um, and, 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 and quizzing you and making sure you're ready for that exam and giving you just the right amount of content so that you're right at the point of readiness to learn. You know, so I think it's real personalization at the end of the day. Um, but that's, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm waiting for that day. But yeah. it'll take I was going to say there's no killer app, but I want to change my answer to what she said. <laughs> <laughs> and I went in. Yeah. Uh, I haven't heard that thought before. That's, that's pretty good. Um, I don't know if this is, you know, relevant to education, but I would say killer app in general is gonna come from uh, integrations of multiple different technologies. So if you think about you know, the VR piece from the immersiveness standpoint, you think about AI from uh, the, the point of adding analytics and maybe decision systems or uh, data that can be drilled down on within the immersive experience, certainly the, um, the machine vision aspect and, and um, access to the neural networks for the image processing piece of things and, and what you can do with that, et cetera. You know, when you integrate all those things, then you can actually start to have a, almost like a, a bionic-like experience. So mm -hmm. if you think about the medical thing, right, 
once you've got all that stuff incorporated, machine vision can point out, say, a tumor within the, um, the VR representation of a CAT scan or something like that that aids the doctor in diagnosing that, but then the doctor may not actually have enough. So then using um, the data analytics and the AI, he can actually drill down into that, start to pull that uh, cell uh, mutation apart or something of that nature. So I think, I think all of those things mm -hmm. together is when it's gonna be really killer. Excellent. And, and I think build, so building on that technology aspect, I think honestly it's, it's yeah, it's absolutely um, going to be more of a platform, right? And I think the key thing for education and for you guys is going to be about creating that platform that just makes things really easy for you guys to do your shit every day, right? I think that's ultimately what it is, right? It's being able to kind of like create this platform and create this technology kind of layer um, that becomes very easy, very low barrier to entry, very easy for you guys to take what you do and apply it in this new way. I think that's really going to be the ultimate thing that, that kind of like sells it in to everybody. Because, you know, the moment it's easy, that's the moment that everybody can jump on board mm. and, and kind of participate with it. Mm. 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 It's hat ticks. That's the answer. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> once, people, once people can touch stuff, every single walk of life will want a piece of this technology. Mm. It's not an app. I know it's a technology, but yeah. as soon as and haptics, what would they use that for? <laughs> many things. <laughs> Back to Bernie Dodge's earlier The same thing that e-com yeah, was yeah. first used for. Right on. Um, great. Well, I, we've a few minutes left, so I'd love to open it up for questions. Do we have the catch box going on? We do. So it's in the back. So uh, Peter, in the back. I love this catch box thing. So um, somebody had already mentioned um, the first elephant in the room. I want to uh, suggest that there's a second element, uh, elephant. <clears throat> I'm curious because of the first day of uh, class this semester, um, and I do this every semester. I said, how much are you spending on books? Yeah. And uh, the average was about 450 to $500, okay, for all of their courses. And I had one girl come up and say, um, I actually don't have any money right now. Um, how much is your course going to cost? And I said, it's free. And so when we start talking about all these lovely programs, the death or life of uh, VR, et cetera, I think we need to talk about kind of that base level, especially with all of us in this room coming from higher education, most of us. Because uh, if we make, if we, if we can't sell them for 99 cents or a buck 99, then I can tell you that a lot of students at San Jose State are just not gonna be able to afford a lot of this stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's not, an, it's not a function of um, love or no love for, for, the, um, for this uh, particular strain of, of, of learning. It's a function of the dollar. And so I'm curious from the group up here, some industry folks, et cetera, have you thought about kind of this balance between uh, cost, the business model, to use Carrie's um, uh, reference earlier, and the reality that it takes five years to put together a really good game? Right? There's got to be something in between so we can make sure that our students get the training, but it doesn't cost them another $150 or $200 for, for one course. Yeah, I mean, that's a big problem for us. The experiences aren't rich enough to charge something for it at this point, you know? So, so you're in this, this catch-22 situation. You're not going to produce that much of it because all you're getting back out of it is branding value, right? So until there's, you know, it's rich enough that people actually want to pay for it, you have that problem. Go ahead. I, I was just going to say, so, I mean, from a, from a pure business perspective, I mean, a lot of that's just scale, right? I mean, the, the more you can scale it up, the cheaper it becomes for everybody. Right. Um, and ultimately, I mean, to the killer app idea, I mean, if you can have something that is ubiquitous across everybody, Pokemon like, Go. Yeah, Pokemon Go, yeah. right? Which, which is essentially free, right? So if we go from a gaming model, right? You know, free to play is a very big thing right now, where ultimately, you know, you get the content out there and then uh, you, you pay for various levels of, of how you want to participate with it. Um, but ultimately, I think, yeah, I mean, scale, I think, will be, will be the, the absolutely biggest thing there and the most important thing. And also, I think, you know, going back to Vinay's thing this morning and the keynote, you know, it, it's going to be different use cases for different things. I mean, for, for the textbook thing, 
that may start off as a pure just AR tablet phone driven experience, right? Of, of being able to kind of interact with stuff like that. And then within the colleges themselves, you may have more of the labs where you have the higher end kind of VR experiences and, and they offer different kind of learning experiences. So I think it's, you know, it's, it's infinitely scalable, I think, using different technologies and stuff, yeah. And I'll, um, I would add, I'm an optimist on this one, I think, because we've seen that whether it's apps or e-text, um, faculty are not in it to monetize. Um, you know, what they teach, they already share all the knowledge they can. So what we found is that uh, if they've created these things, they, they, they'll give them away for free. I mean, we made five apps that are now in the uh, iTunes store that are free. Um, and you can learn biostatistics or nematode classification, you know. So I think once that gets rolling, plus there's a new executive order out that's going to require us to identify the courses in our university that are free. And so guess what? There's going to be sort of market pressure um, for students who can now choose the free courses. Um, so I think with the whole OER movement, uh, op open educational resources, um, I'm, I'm hoping that's not going to be a problem. Maybe you time for one more response. I, th I think it's all about dialogue. Obviously, being with my Pearson hat on, I'm not going to say anything's going to be given away for free because they sell an awful lot of textbooks and they want to sell an awful lot of AR and VR. But I, I think it's about dialogue at this nascent stage of this technology. So, for example, sir, if you're saying a course... X requires a student to buy over the course of a year $450 worth of textbooks to be proficient in the course. Well, let's take that as a budget of $450 and work out what the, what the new technologies can replace and where we can take the pressure off the existing courseware units. So I would say it's about a dialogue at this stage. Obviously, before we're at full scale, we're going to have to work with smart institutions that are early adopters and work something out that is mutually beneficial. But... Uh, as Aaron said, once we're at scale, we, we've got an opportunity to really drive the cost down because versioning is not an issue. We don't need to print a whole new run of stuff. We just change the CMS and it updates. So I'm very positive about how we can get to a good outcome on that. You want last word? Yeah, I think that one of the models I've seen um, successful for us is, is having, instead of having the students expected to pay for this and using that model of textbooks, shifting to a different model. Um, for example, the, uh, there's a Florida consortia that came on with us to say, we want this solution and we're going to give it, we're going to purchase it at the consortia level so that we can then act, give that back to this large community of students. Um, and maybe that's something that that lines up really well with where we are with VR technology um, you know maybe right now we can't expect the students to pay for this so where does that leave um, decision makers that kind of go in the middle of um, companies like us and um, the the purchasers and then the students as the end users to say here's here's the value we see and we want to invest in it now um, I think it's it's easy to want to draw parallels between textbooks and VR, um, but we also should look at where the differences are so that we don't get stuck in a catch-22 of not really being able to implement anything at all. Yeah, good point. Well, that's all the time we have, so let's give a round of applause to our amazing panelists. And I believe we have, uh, well, Michael, you can tell us what we're doing next. Tell yeah, Thank we're, you. we're going to have a reception for hopefully some of you can stay around for a little while. Um, the, I am an innovation officer, but I'm not a magician, so the state of California will not be buying you drinks. <laughs> Unfortunately, you're going to have to cover that yourself, but Sean's offered to buy the first round, so talk to Sean. Um, I just, just a couple of quick things, and then I'll let you go. I'm, I'm clear I'm standing between you and overpriced drinks. Um, uh, for just follow-ups, um, there will be, as we mentioned, an email list going out, a list of attendees and their emails. If for some reason you want to opt out of that, please let us know and we can take you off. But we're hoping that this is part of the value that we're adding for all of you is the ability to connect. Um, and there, we're looking at other uh, follow-ups and there's been some suggestions today. Please feel free to reach out to me if you have thoughts about what we should be doing to help build a learning community around immersive learning for uh, Cal State, let me know, and if we can, we'll try to figure out a way to provide it. Um, we've it's already been suggested we need to have some kind of repository for materials that could be shared, and there's, I have some different thoughts about how we might go about that. Um, and lastly, um, we're going to be sending out an evaluation 
Uh, and I almost never respond to evaluations, but um, <laughs> James told me it's going to be one question. Okay, there's going to be one question, which is basically, you know, did you like it, right? And that's useful to us. And then there's going to be a second question, which is, do you have any suggestions? And you don't have to fill that out. So all you have to do is like check yes, no. And we would really appreciate it if you would open the spam when it, I mean the email when it comes, hit the link, which we promise won't take you to a, a, a Chinese uh, fishing site, and click on that link and tell us what you thought, and preferably give us some thoughts about because we we, we hope we may want to do this again. If enough of you say it was valuable to us, then we hope we'll do it again. So um, please do tell us. What, how we can provide more value to you so we can do a better job for you. I want to again thank uh, James and Sean and Polly and Trish and uh, all the video team. We're making all there's video recordings of this. Those will be available to you as well. And, and who am I forgetting? Rudy and Mark and everyone else um, who contributed, um, did a ton of work here at San Diego State to make this possible. Thank you so much, all of you. Thank you to our fabulous panelists. Really interesting, really great to hear from all of you. I really, some people really made an effort to come here uh, just to be here for us. So I want to thank all of you for being here. So let's thank the panel and the first panel one more time. Thank you.